Well, uh, as you know, this um, session is named the geopolitics of security. And um, after dramatic uh, events in Paris, this situation has placed security matters back uh, on top of the international scenario as a priority on global geopolitics, taking into account that today's security is understood as a wider concept, one might think that these terrorist attacks are result of Islamic radicalism. And uh, it is basic. But it's not as simple as a religion matter, neither a cultural or civilization clashes. It goes beyond. Regarding terrorist attacks, not many people talk about geopolitics and the impact of the political relation between developed and developing countries. This is a global issue, not just Europe or US against jihadists. It, it involves the rest of the world. We cannot ignore the role of international institutions in this matter. There is many questions. Are they prepared to face these new challenges? What is the leadership role that countries from the South should play in this transitional time? Are we able to achieve minimum consensus to preserve global and regional governance? This session is uh, an extraordinary opportunity to listen to reflections that uh, positively contribute to the debate with such uh, experienced speakers that ensures a uh, deep analysis. Some reflections, some questions. It's clear that we live in a fragile war, rapid in what I call Call peace, call peace that I consider extremely dangerous. The world is immersed in a period of transition. If you analyze all what we have been saying during the day, it's clear that it's a consensus that this transition is going to take time. There is also clear that there is a fragmentation in the political and commercial aspects. And uh, there is uh, a distrust regarding institutions that obligate today to rethink many institutions and to to analyze what institutions should do for uh, keeping peace and security in the world. Our first uh, commenter today will be uh, the Secretary General of the Organization of American States. And uh, for me, it's a pleasure to present uh, Secretary General Jose Miguel Insulza. I knew him many times, many years ago. We were, we were colleagues when I was foreign minister, he was foreign minister, and when he was Secretary General of the OES, I was the chairman of the Inter-American Juridical Committee. Mm -hmm. Then it's a pleasure, Jose Miguel, to present you, and I believe that the issue that also you are going to present drugs is one of the main issues regarding this, uh, this topic. Welcome. Thank you very much. And, uh, first, let me, uh, let me see if this works first. Yes. Well, if the first thing that I would like to say is that uh, I, I think that uh, choosing this, this subject when we deal with uh, 
geopolitics and uh, international relations and with uh, with the issues of security is uh, very very relevant to deal with this problem of drugs i think that every con in spite of the uh, the relationship that ex exists between among some between uh, the different aspects of security uh, it's very clear for us that for example that latin america is not exempt of um, uh, incidents of terrorism Many people believe that our commission, our international, inter-American commission on, on terrorism, at the OAS, was created for 9/11. It was created about six years before that for the army at the uh, the army at the, at the, 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 the in, in Buenos Aires, which which several people were killed, as you know. So we are not exempt of this. But that said. It is very clear that the, the, the major needs, the major problems of security that are recognized by everybody and that, uh, by the way, are qualified as the, the, the main problem the, the countries affect in, in, in the majority of the countries of Latin America are the problems having to do with public security. The public, public security has replaced external security and several others in the minds of the people of our region. And that is even in the countries that have relatively ro low rates of crime for Mormadas. And it's only natural. As I said, we don't have, in spite of all that many acts of terrorism, we don't have that, uh, the, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, problems of fundamentalism that other countries, that other regions have. We have no wars. We haven't had any wars in Latin America in the past uh, uh, 85 years. And uh, the, we are a free, a, a free, a, a, a zone free of, of nuclear weapons, and that is respected by big powers and everybody in the world. So it's only natural that the eyes of people turn to the real problem of the region, which is the issue of public security. We have among, we have three of Lat three Latin American and Caribbean countries among the five countries with highest rates of crime of homicide in the world. Which is a big problem. I mean, I mean big, a big problem, considering that there are no wars. I mean, considering that there, I mean, there are not that kind of killing doesn't happen. This is basically common crime and organized crime, and that is what's, what's playing in our region. And in that, the issue of drugs is central. I mean, there's no doubt that the problem of drugs uh, has become uh, is the I would say the hub of criminal activity in the region. Of course, there are other other problems. We have a uh, human traffic, we have gun smuggling, we have a lot of crime in the streets, etc. But the, the, the issue of, of, of drugs and, orga, and organized crime is very much at the center of the problem. And it's very tempting, I should say, from a conceptual point of view, and very reasonable, by the way, to treat the problem of drugs in the world and the, of drugs in the Americas from a geopolitical perspective. After all, several of the dimensions that I usually mention when you talk about, uh, about uh, ge geopolitics have, have this connotation. Organized crime occupies the, some important spaces, la lands, in some of the most affected countries. There is an actual battle, a permanent war, whether it is uh, between the security forces or armed forces with the criminal gangs or from the criminal gangs among themselves. And uh, there's the occupation of territories. It's a problem that goes beyond borders, in which the, the, the geographic position of the countries and territories can be used to explain the different effects that drug traffic okay, produces in each of them, whether they are countries of origin, countries of transit, countries, countries of final destination. The problem of drugs as a lasting effects in the economy of the country and demographic effects too. And then, of course, uh, it is true that the war on drugs, because we are talking about the war on drugs, that is the, the strategy of the past four decades can be summarized with the name war on drugs. That's the way it was called. Fortunately, the name has ceased to be used. You, 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 you read the the papers in the U.S. and the documents of the last five years, there has no, been no more talk about war on drugs. Which that's, a, that's a big progress already. But it occupied the, the whole of the problem for a long time. And that has meant death, force the disappearing, destruction, which are proper of, a, of a, an armed conflict more than a simple uh, common crime. It has uh, 
condition very much the, the strategic designs, the size, the forms, the deployment of armed forces in the region, and even the international relations of countries among themselves. However, when you treat the, the issue of drugs as a geopolitical issue, it's, uh, you feel a little bit uncomfortable too, because actually that's not what we want. I mean, this is not what we want. It's not, it's not helpful for a progressive policy, policy for the future. We should look, should, should look for some other approach. To the, to the, and that's why this, is, this, I would say, basic insatisfaction was what, what provoked in the 2010 and, and, 12, and, and 12, excuse me, a decision by the presidents of the Americas to ask for a, a full report on the matter to the Organization of American States to see if we could deal with the matter of drugs in a different way. Uh, and actually, that's the report that has President Lagos mentioned this morning. I'm going to refer to it partially, but then but conclude with some, a couple of general conclusions. Well, the first thing is that um, in spite of this, this war, I mean, the insatisfaction is due to a, to a very simple fact. And the war has, uh, had, had been successful in the, sense, in the sense that uh, may, several large quantities of drugs have been confiscated during the past 40 years. And if you take the figures of, 19, of, of 2008, I think, you know, 2011, excuse me, 11, uh, the estimation is that about 11, about one, uh, over 50 percent of the cocaine that was produced in the in the region was confiscated, and that's a big success. And then, if you take the 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 number of prisoners that you take in any war, I'm going to talk about the deaths later. In any war, uh, there are I, I would estimate the estimates that we have about 3.7 million people in, in prison in, Latin, in, the, in the Americas, and over one-third of them are there for drugs. About 40% of, the of them are there for drugs. So we've taken a lot of prisoners in the war against drugs. The problem is that the amount of the, 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 the real ob objective of this, which is drug use, has increased, and more people have been damaged, uh, and the uh, under the, 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 the drug traffic, we have seen the rise of enormous fortunes, a large, a very large uh, underground economy, which is, uh, I would say, we, we, our, our report estimates in $151 billion a year, which is more, much more than the GNP of several Latin American countries, and uh, a lot of victims, many people who have died there. And I would just give, well, to give you one figure because actually it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, uh, no, the way this is, uh, the, the, what, 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 the, 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 the traffic in Latin, the worth of the traffic in Latin America, in, in the Americas, in drugs, is one half of the full traffic around the world. We have over 50 percent of the consumers of cocaine, as more or less the same size of consumers of amphetamines, and about 30, per, about one third of the consumers of marijuana, a little bit less probably. But uh, well, the figure I wanted to give, which is really terrible, is that uh, uh, just one figure for one country in one year. In Mexico, the government estimated that between, uh, in, in some years, excuse me, between December 2006 and December 2011, that's five years, about uh, 500, uh, excuse me, the, w, the World Health Organization estimated that they recorded about 500, 563 deaths as a product of, uh, of use of controlled drugs in that period in the Americas. In the, those five years, 563 people died directly from drug consumption. At the same time, 60,000 60, people died in the war of drugs as a result of executions, clashes between rival groups, attacks on the authorities by criminal organizations involved in drug trafficking. So the big problem here is the drug war. And one must admit that the fact that people die for using drugs is a terrible thing. One must admit that that also carries within destruction of lives, 
a lot of people who become useless for society, high costs in matter of health. That is very true. But what we should discuss is if the choice of the politics, I mean, if we, 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 if we discuss this matter, which we very, have very clear, that the, 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 the choice of politics has, has meant that so many other, so many more people have died in the drug wars than what they have prevent, that they, they have managed to prevent, and that is something that necessarily has to has to change. In the period of uh, of uh, at the same time, for the same period, we have similar similar figures for Brazil, a little bit larger because of the size of the country, and the number of murders in that country was even higher than the one in Mexico. And most of them relate, many of them related to the drug, to the drug traffic. So we, have, we, we reached several conclusions, and I don't want to tie it because I don't think I have much time. I will not give here the conclusions of the report. Uh, we have to uh, necessarily recognize first this as a hemispheric problem. This is a hemispheric problem. I mean, the, market, the, 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 the drugs are produced in countries of the hemisphere, they are transferred through countries of the hemisphere, they are refined in countries of the hemisphere, and they are sold in countries of the hemisphere. And when they complete this process, the cost of one ton of, uh, of drug in the jungles of uh, Bolivia or Peru it was about uh, 500 to 700 dollars. Uh, we'll be, we have, we'll have multiplied its, 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 its price by 500 times when it reaches the street of, a, of, a, of a, the streets of South America, of, of North America. So this is big business. It's good for everybody. The peasants who cultivate it make money. The people who transfer it make money. The people who, who smuggle it through frontiers make money. And the final the final detail, retailers makes two-thirds of the whole money, eh, by the way, because the, the gains, 66% of, of the gains remains, remain in the countries of consumption. But it's good for everybody. And what are we selling? We are selling a product that people are going to find a way to consume anyway, and we are selling it at a cost of illegality that, that leaves behind several thousand, thousand deaths a year. What do we propose? What do we, what, what do we, what, I mean, and we have some conventions, by the way, in the region, in the, in the world, that uh, I mean, leave very little space for, uh, to begin attacking the problem. That's why the, the focus of the, in the past two or three years has been rather disorderly. We have so many people now convinced that we have to do something. The first one, of course, was not, as always happened, was not a, an international organization or a country. It was more a, an organization of uh, former presidents and statesmen. President Lagos here is a part of the Global Commission on Drugs, proposing different alternatives. And we propose also some others, and some governments have done things. And by the way, <laughs> In the U.S., some things have happened that have not happened anywhere, anywhere, anywhere else, and I will mention a couple of them, which is not, I'm not going to necessarily to mention the marijuana thing. There's some other things that have happened. But this is still rather disorderly, and I think that we should focus, as an international community, in two or three main issues. First, I do believe that uh, uh, it's, in, it's impossible to change policies from one day to the other, therefore, we should favor some experiences and some possibilities dealing with some drugs and see what, the, what, results, what results can be produced. What I'm saying is that I am not in favor, we are aware of the organization, I'm not in favor today of issuing a full statement saying we have to legalize marijuana. But we look, we fav we look favorably at that exp the experience that are taking place in some parts of the world and in the region on different forms of control of that drug, which is certainly the less, the less damaging one. We have some cases in the states, of, in the, states of, the, of the Union. We have the case of Uruguay. Some countries are trying that. By the way, the market is adapting. What I said before, they are going to do it anyway. A recent, uh, a recent uh, study published in the Washington Post, I think, shows that 
the, uh, the smuggling of marijuana from Mexico to the U.S. has fallen by 50 percent. Does that mean that people are smoking less? No, that means that they are producing it locally. But what are the drug, what are the drug laws doing? Well, they have increased the heroin. They have increased amphetamines. And they are looking for other shares of the market to, to work with. We don't reduce the problem, but at least we can have some experience and some intelligence on the matter. By the way, I must say that I'm not, I mean, I hope that, the, that the, the, a new policy would reduce the, the market. But let us remember that the damages of the consumption are, are much lower than the damages of the, of the, of the illegal smuggling. Therefore, if you, if we, I mean, we, are, we, we, we should look basically to eliminating the wars and eliminate what really provokes the crime and the deaths. So that's one possibility. We should concentrate, and I think that the experiences with marijuana are really good experiences. I mean, we can evaluate those experiences to see if it's, to see if it's worth going into other drugs in matters of, uh, of also legalizing the trade. Second, I think that, uh, I said it before, we have so many people in the region in jail for, for drug smuggling or for drugs. Even though several countries say that they don't condemn con consumption, that drug use is not condemned, because actually if you look at the Convention of the United Nations, the Convention of the United Nations begin begins with the definition of what is, what, is, what is prohibited, and it uses about 25 verbs of things that are prohibited. Producing, transferring, cons consuming, cultivating, etc. It never says using. We are not bound by convention to, pro to, to, to condemn the use of drugs. And several of the people who are in jail in the region are in jail for using drugs or for transferring very small quantities of drugs. I think this is the experience in the US uh, Justice Department is an interesting one to, to follow. There's a policy issued by the, by the, by the, by the secretary, by the, by the, 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 the attorney general, calling uh, pro uh, prosecutors all over the country to release many people who are in jail for, for, using, for using or for transferring very small quantities of drugs. That would certainly reduce the pressure. By the way, it would reduce also a big problem we have in, in Latin America, which is the overcrowding of jails. We have in all the Americas, the jails are overcrowded with people, com with, with people in, in, in jail for drugs, and it would allow the police to concentrate in matters that are really, on, on matters that are really important, such as the big uh, uh, money laundering and the, the, the labor of the, clan, of the clans, which are because usually who, who, the, those that are paying are the, the, the small soldiers of the drug traffic and not the big. And third, I think that going into that, that, that's, that, that, that if we do those two things, I mean, if we can agree on uh, accepting the experiences for legalization of uh, drugs and see what happens with them, as, as happened in, in, in Uruguay. In Uruguay, by the way, and I think that's true, that's, a, that's a, a proper, they identify their policy as a new form of control, of drug control, not as a, as a legalization, but that's, that's something that I think is, uh, is important to say. But we should allow those experiences to happen. Second, I think that we should all that we should try to commit the countries to not to punish drug offenders. This is completely crazy. We are saying that drug consumption is a, 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 an illness. You don't send ill people to jail. You treat them. So increases in treatment and releasing of people who are in jail for very small drug offenses is something that will help a lot and strengthen the issue of law and order, certainly. I am not, we are not, we are not uh, asking for a, a, a reprieve for the drug laws of the criminals. We have to issue, we have to, 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 to issue, to strengthen the issues of law and order, but uh, strengthen it in the aspects in which it's really worth it. I mean, the money laundering is still very high. Our estimate is that still that around 90% of the money that's made in the, in the drug business is not confiscated. It's, recycled into other sectors of society. This, uh, this is essential. I mean, this is a, a geopolitical problem because it's illegal, because it's violent, and because it makes a lot of money. Let's concentrate on the legality 
on the violence and on the reduction of the money of the, of the, of the, of the gains, and we can make some results. We can get some results. I myself, people feel people that people, that people will continue to cons use consuming drugs anyway. They will, they will find them some way. But at least we will have reduced the magnitude of the problem, and we will be talking about the, the problem of drug consumption as a health problem, and not as a geopolitical problem as we are addressing it today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. It's very clear that there is new approach in, in, in this fight. I'm sure that the next summit of the Americas will receive a lot of ideas uh, and uh, in new, in this new dialogue that we are going to have, uh, drugs will be a, a, an issue of importance for, for all of us. Thank you very much. Um, it also uh, shows how important is the, the quality of policies and the quality of institutions. And I believe that that's a very good point uh, of what the Secretary General had mentioned. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Domitila Sagramoso. She is from the Keen uh, College, uh, London, and Royal Institute of International Affairs. Um, she's an expert in, in Russia and I believe that uh, she is going to make a very good uh, uh, ideas and topics regarding Russia today because uh, as I mentioned the, in this uh, fragile war conflict with Russia today is a crucial one please go ahead Thank you very much. Is it is it okay? The microphone? Yes. Um, uh, first of all, I really would like to thank uh, CAF and the LSE for giving me a chance to share <coughs> my views on Russia at this very prestigious seminar with uh, such a distinguished audience. Uh, I was asked to discuss Russia's perspectives on the new security challenges. Uh, and I think I will devote attention to three main points, and I hope I will have time to cover them uh, sufficiently. If not, I'm very happy to take questions, because uh, all of them are really very relevant, and there's quite a lot to, to say and to discuss. Uh, the nature of the international system and how Russia perceives itself, um, the relation of Russia with Ukraine and European security, and last but not least, how Russia is concerned about uh, Islamic radicalism, and I think last week's events in Paris uh, bring this again to the limelight. Um, there are many other issues which are of relevance to Russia in terms of security, but I think this focus is going to give uh, a very interesting uh, discussion point, uh, a starting point. But uh, I think especially with this audience, it's impossible to discuss Russia now, today, without looking at its sort of economic and political setting, because I think the situation is very different today to what it was a few months ago and even a year ago. Um, first of all, we know that the economic situation of Russia is very dire because of the sanctions that have been imposed and also because of the collapse of the oil price, which is now reaching uh, $50 per barrel. So this has a very negative impact, of course, on the Russian economy, which already was in a very fragile situation uh, because it had an economy that was very much dependent on uh, high, energy, high energy prices and it was very much driven by consumption, very poor business climate and a lack of effective uh, protection of property rights. This together with a very strong involvement of the state in the economy and a sort of crony capitalism. So already the situation was, was very weak and the introduction of sanctions and the fall in the oil price made it much worse. And we've seen that with the fall of the ruble, which lost almost 50% of its value in the last year. Uh, and it was partic particularly sharp, the fall in December, and this forced uh, the increase of interest rates uh, to, from 10 to 17% by the central bank. Uh, and forced Russia also the central bank to intervene many times to stem the fall of the ruble, losing a lot of its currency reserves. Uh, 
so this is really a very difficult situation, uh, and uh, I, at the moment Russia's uh, GDP seems to be shrinking. Now, despite this very gloomy picture, uh, the paradox uh, with Russia, which is uh, always a very fascinating country to look at, is that Putin pop Putin's popularity remains over 80%, according to the Levada Center, which is one of the most independent centers. So definitely yet, he hasn't been really shaken by the difficulties of the economic situation. And uh, after 15 years at the head of Russia, more or less, uh, he really has managed to establish very much of a dominance within the political system. And I think at the moment, any speculation about a possible successor, which was something was discussed before, uh, has really very much uh, ceased. And although there was hope uh, with uh, the sanctions that there would be some kind of regime change in some way, I think that this probability is very unlikely. Uh, instead, what we see is that uh, with the annexation of Crimea, there was really a sort of an explosion of public triumphalism, and uh, this has really flattened rather than enriched the political debate in Russia. So the situation is a very, very difficult one, and this has an impact on economic policy because there is very limited debate, and we hear some voices which are calling for change, but still Putin is relying on a very limited number of um, advisors. Uh, what is more, more of more concern is that now the very nationalist views have become very much mainstream in Russia. And this brings me to addressing directly now the security challenges and how Russia faces uh, the new sort of world order. And before I move into this, I want to make a, a, a sort of a caveat that I really want to share with you what I think is the Russian point of view, not my own. It doesn't mean that I'm sharing it. I just want for once that we sit and look at the view, how it looks from the Kremlin. Because I think that a very important uh, problem which we faced during the crisis in Ukraine was the bad reporting and the one-sidedness and the difficulties of trying to look at the things from the other point of view. Um, Starting with how Russia sees the international system, we know that already since the late 1990s, Russia has put a lot of emphasis on the need to develop a multipolar world and very strong concern over uh, the unipolarism which uh, emerged as a result of the end of the Cold War and uh, also what Russians call sort of the Western US unilateral behavior which began in Kosovo. It then ex uh, happened as well in Iraq, uh, also was seen as a result of NATO enlargement, withdrawal from the ABM treaty, so a series of elements uh, which are seen as if the, the West, NATO, and the US are really not taking into account or not respecting international law or international rules. Uh, what Russia really wants, and you, you look at this time and time again in many of the discourses, is equality and mutual respect in international relations. It doesn't mean that Russia is not ready to cooperate on issues which it thinks uh, there could be some room for cooperation, and it's very eager to do that, but in some way that Russia is not not sort of a minor player in a circle of Western-centric institutions. Uh, and also an, an emphasis on diversifying away from the West, which was very pronounced during the 1990s, into developing relations with, a, with Asia, with Ch China, with India, uh, and also with the Middle East, and more recently with Latin America, which is really uh, a, a very interesting development. Um, so very much this idea on emphasis on international institutions, on respect for the UN Charter and the UN Security Council, because of course Russia has a veto, and in this way it can make sure that its interests are not challenged, and especially in areas which are close to its borders, because this really has been an issue of concern, and time and time again there is a perception among Russian, uh, Russian elites that the West is not taking interest, Russia's interests into account, and that it's trying in some way to weaken Russia, to ignore its interests when it's trying to resolve issues of international security. And for this, this is seen as increasingly destabilizing for Russia. That's why um, 
there is an increasing emphasis. We see that, for example, in the speeches that Putin has given recently in the Vidal Club, this idea that a new world order has to be built where rules are respected and where stability and security is brought back. Russia is very concerned for what it sees of instability in the international order and what it calls an attempt to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, which from the Russian point of view means a concern about regime change, which is something which has very much been in the agenda if we think about Iraq, if we think about the colored revolutions in Georgia and in Ukraine or in Libya uh, more recently. So this is very much an issue of concern. Uh, of course, we can then discuss to what extent Russia itself is respecting uh, yeah, the territorial integrity of its neighbors. But this is a paradox that Russia is both in a way a conservative player, but at the same time, it's increasingly becoming a revisionist actor and is creating instability along its borders. But I would argue that a lot of it is a sense of reaction to what Russia perceived as a very destabilizing uh, move by, by NATO and, and uh, European countries to enlarge very close to its borders. And this, together with a sense that um, Russia, or that there was an attempt to weaken its attempts at integration within the former Soviet space, were seen as key challenges to its own security. So not only NATO enlargement, but also perception that the, that the West or the international community was not allowing Russia effectively to integrate with its neighbors. And that there was an active process to create what uh, is usually called geopolitical pluralism within Eurasia. Uh, and this brings me to the second point, which is of great concern to Russia, and this is the relation with Ukraine. So <clears throat> what, is, what does Ukraine mean to Russia, and how are we going to evaluate this crisis? Um, it seems a bit of an understatement to say that for Russia, Ukraine is crucial. Uh, but it's important to remember that in 1991, it was a Russian leader with a Ukrainian Belarusian leaders who sat in Belarus and put the Soviet Union to an end. Uh, so in a way, it was Yeltsin who helped Ukraine achieve its independence. And although it always at least officially recognize independence or the independent borders of Ukraine, from the Russian point of view, Ukraine was always special. And the idea that was that a very close and special relationship should be kept with Ukraine. And I think this is something that in the West was never properly understood. And East Europeans were never really very happy. And I would even say that people in West Ukraine were almost trying to subvert. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the, the lack of understanding of what Ukraine meant to Russia uh, was, um, was a, is a key problem uh, for our relations with Ukraine and Russia. Why, why do we think Russia wants or is, thinks it should have such a close relationship? Of course, there's a sort of obvious economic uh, interactions, the dependency, mutual trade, energy transit routes tra transiting through Ukraine, Ukraine depending on Russia for energy. But there is also very much uh, an interaction of trade and investment. There's a lot of Russian investment which moved into Ukraine and Ukrainian investment into Russia. So there are very strong economic ties between these two countries. And this was one of the issues of concern. We can say rightly or wrongly, which worried Russia about the association agreement with uh, the European Union, which Ukraine was about to sign in, in uh, um, November of 2013. Um, at the political level, uh, what is really uh, unacceptable uh, to Russia is that Ukraine and Russia might be put in opposing geopolitical, geopolitical blocks. Uh, there is always this idea that Russia and Ukraine should at least share a similar geo geopolitical fate and that they would in some way belong to if not the same block, at least not opposing blocks. Because the worst case scenario, and you, I've heard this 10 years ago, and I thought it was such an uh, sort of un unrealistic scenario would be a war between Russia and Ukraine because for them it's sort of a civil war in the same way we would envisage today between England and Scotland. Uh, it's really the worst case scenario. Why is that? Not only because of the strong historical ties, but also because they're very strong personal ties. And also there's a very strong cultural identity which is shared by men in East Ukraine uh, and the Crimea with Russia. The language, uh, the world outlook, the perception about the Soviet era, the perceptions about the Second World War, the Great Patriotic War. And these views are not often shared by East people in West Ukraine, uh, uh, which feel a lot closer to the European civilization and want to be part of the Euro-Atlantic structures. And this view is now gaining ground throughout most of Ukraine. 
Uh, and this explains why the whole process of association agreement between the European Union and Ukraine was of such concern uh, to, um, to Russia. The idea that, for example, Ukraine would be in a different uh, space, at least in terms of movement of peoples, was unacceptable for, for Russia. The idea that it would be a Schengen space where Ukraine would be a member and not, not Russia uh, was totally unthinkable, let alone membership into NATO, which is what all expected after the fall of the Yanukovych regime, that a pro-Western Ukrainian government would immediately bring Ukraine into NATO. Uh, now it seems the process is more or less um, starting to kick uh, uh, um, to start again, but I don't think it's going to happen very soon. Uh, of course, it is clear that Ukraine uh, wanted to uh, that Russia wanted Ukraine to be part of the uh, Eurasian Union project, which would have helped it to give much more of a critical mass. But I think now the situation uh, is is a bit um, out of the picture. Uh, and um, just to say a few words about. Um, Russia, Russia's involvement, there is little doubt that Russia was fully involved, uh, of course, in the annexation of Crimea, and it provided support to the republics in the east, in Donetsk and Lugansk. But the only point I want to highlight now, because I'm being told I have how many minutes? Three. Three. Uh, is to say uh, that, um, uh, to say that uh, although Russia became heavily involved, you know, it had, there was a constituency in East Ukraine for that support. And I can expand on that in the Q&A if you wish. And I want to say, I, I can also discuss what are the limits of the current embargo and to what extent the current military tensions are going to be uh, resolved. I am not very optimistic because the last attempts at Astana uh, yesterday were canceled. So the situation doesn't look very good. And if I have two minutes, I may just say, just a few words about what the situation is in the North Caucasus, because I think this is very, very relevant. And this is a point where Russia and uh, the West can really cooperate. And many of you might not be following events in the North Caucasus, but the terrorist violence in the Muslim republics of the North Caucasus is going on on a regular basis. It has spread away from Chechnya, but all the neighboring republics, from the Caspian almost to the Black Sea, have regularly seen terrorist attacks where people are being shot, uh, officials, religious figures. And a lot of these attacks are conducted by so-called jihadist fighters who are increasingly adopting a similar ideology and a similar point of view to the global jihadist networks. They're increasingly calling for the establishment of an Islamic state. They're sharing views with Islamic fighters worldwide. They're increasingly adopting a sort of anti-Western, anti-Jewish discourse, and they are using also very brutal terrorist methods. So although this was not the case in the 1990s, early 2000s, we really see a transformation of the whole insurgency in the North Caucasus. And again, I think I have 30 seconds left, so I cannot say much more, but I can discuss a lot of the details if you wish. Um, what is more interesting about the recent developments in this respect is the fact that a lot of the fighters, Chechen fighters from Chechnya and from many parts of Russia, are now going to fight in Syria, and this is a novelty. Uh, and the same concerns that we see here in the West about what to do with former fighters coming back, how to address radicalization, what to do about Muslim integration, all these factors are crucial in Russia as they are in the West. And the experiences of the very ineffective counter-radicalization policies that Russia has conducted in the North Caucasus could be serving as a lesson, because I think that unfortunately, they might be a call for much stricter measures now after what we've seen in Paris. And so we need to be very, very cautious because a lot of these measures that were introduced in Russia in the last years, banning certain publications of the Quran, forcing people not to wear the hijab, and similar things have really had a very negative repercussion. So I think we need to be very careful. And I think here, my last words are, there's really an opportunity for us to cooperate with Russia in the West and bring back this sort of cooperation in the international arena, which Russia is so keen to achieve. Thank you. Uh, Domitila, thank you very much. It has been an extraordinary presentation. I'm sure that um, in our uh, period of question and answer, you will receive many questions, but it has been an extraordinary presentation, very clear, and I really appreciate that because of this, of this case. Um, now, um, our next speaker is uh, Dino Matani. 
He works for the UN Security Council, and he has a lot of experience as a former uh, correspondent for the Financial Times and Reuters. Dino, it's your, your turn. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> just a brief word about me. Um, I'm, I'm formerly LSE um, alum, well, formerly an LSE student, so alumni, um, and here to talk about uh, state failure and the rise of terrorism. My background is as a journalist and as an investigator for the UN Security Council, which has been mandated to identify financial and material support and uh, individuals who support uh, armed groups. Over the last two, three years, I've been working in Somalia, uh, mostly on Al-Shabaab, um, the Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, armed group. Um, and so I'm not here as an academic or necessarily even a policy maker. Um, I'm here as a messenger, uh, as someone who has been wading through the gutters uh, uh, in which much of the rivers of reality flow. Um, I think, you know, nobody would disagree that in the current, the current context where in the midst of some powerful forces unleashing themselves, the unraveling of empires which can be best exemplified by the eradication of the Syrian-Iraqi border by Islamic State and the negation of the uh, Sykes-Picot Agreement. Um, but within that context, the capture of state assets and the subversion of democracies by oligarchic elites, sometimes criminal networks, uh, that infect the state and set the ground for uh, uh, um, conflict for, for generations to come. And with, with, you know, in that context, I think, in, in, you know, as regards what I have seen with my own eyes and what rings true to me, uh, having waded through those gutters, the, the issue of corruption is the issue of our time. Um, and we ignore combating this scourge at our peril, especially in the global south, um, where many of the, the countries are that are at the epicenter of, of um, you know, of terrorist networks that are incubating within them. Um, how we tackle corruption, how the global south tackles corruption, given the failure of Western policy as well, uh, I think is, the key, is one of the key issues of, of, of today. Um, before um, I go into case studies, and I think, you know, when talking about this, case studies illustrate, the importance of case studies is that they illustrate mechanics, um, and it's through identifying these mechanics, individuals, specific points of reference where we have the opportunity to design effective policy um, and recommendations to tackle, tackle the scourge of corruption. Um, so before those case studies, I just want to draw your attention to a study that was published last year by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace titled the Corru Corruption, the Unrecognized Threat to International Security. Um, these two graphs, um, I'll come onto them in a second, but I've pulled a number of, just a couple of two or three key paragraphs from that report, which I'll read back to you. Um, one, uh, um, just to frame the debate, one is how we, we, should, how we should understand corruption. Um, acute corruption should be understood not as a failure or distortion of government, but as a functioning system in which ruling networks, and I would add criminal networks as well, use selected levers of power to capture specific revenue streams. This effort often overshadows activities connected with running a state. Um, the other interesting idea that comes out of this paper and which again rings true in, in many of the conflicts that I've, I've looked at is the permeability of the state and, and corruption's role in uh, making, that, making the state permeable. Corruption contributes to international security threats, such as symbiotic relationships between states and transnational organized crime networks, facilitation for terrorist organizations, permeable international security regimes. One only has to look at um, the Iraqi army and the way it has disintegrated in the onslaught of Islamic State, who, who by and large use large quantities of American supplied ammunition to fight the Iraqi army. Um, and acute economic disruptions. And the third idea is how corruption is treated. 
Um, Western policymakers typically prioritize other considerations, such as immediate security imperatives, the economic or strategic value of maintaining relations with a given government, or return on investment over corruption concerns. As a result, Western institutions and individuals often enable corrupt governments, exacerbating security threats and incurring sometimes dangerous reputational risk. Um, again, I think this rings completely true. So for a range of countries around the globe, corruption is allowed to become the system. Um, governments have been repurposed to serve as objective, uh, to serve an objective that has little to do with public administration, uh, but more the personal enrichment, the personal enrichment of ruling networks, and they achieve the same quite effectively. Um, to paraphrase the subtitle of a seminal work on Africa, which I read at this university more than a decade ago, disorder is political instrument. Um, now, if we just turn to these slides, um, I won't dwell on them too long, but you can see, you know, from an empirical point of view, corruption and state failure, there's clearly a correlation there, clearly also a correlation between political stability and the absence of corruption. Um, and yet, the issue of corruption is just simply not on the agenda. I mentioned this just now, uh, you know, when, when the policy debates are being framed. Um, one only has to look at the track record of national anti-corruption agencies. Often they're just a fig leaf for ongoing corruption or a way for donors to claim that they are making strides in terms of doing something against corruption. Um, you know, also the track record of Western corruption agencies. Look at, you know, the pitiful record of uh, prosecutions by the serious fraud office in this country post the Bribery Act of 2010, uh, you know, after which there have been a number of um, publicly reported scandals of uh, uh, corporations that have been involved in the plundering of um, national assets in uh, 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 countries with weak uh, uh, political systems. Um, and, and, and that, you know, corporations often also listed on the London Stock Exchange. Um, so then there's also the, the, the pitfall of, of you know, policymakers looking at corruption, grand corruption or petty corruption or predatory corruption. And actually, I'll go on to talk a little bit about Iraq now, but to, to sort of disaggregate corruption in terms of grand corruption, petty corruption, is almost like describing the steering and brakes of a car as two entirely separate machines. Um, this story was written in November 2008. And it's been forgotten about for years until now. This is the story um, of how the Maliki administration systematically erased all the auditing functions within the ministries. Several years later, on, you know, in the onslaught of Islamic State, Maliki you know, was encouraged to step down uh, as it was widely recognized that the Sunni-Shia split that had emerged had, had emerged principally because of disputes over access to resources. Uh, and, and yet the seeds of this conflict were sown in 2008. There was no pressure put on the Maliki government at that time to do something about this because this was considered an ally at that time for short-term political gain. And yet, several years later, when the milk has been spilt, then there were attempts to have him step down. So for anyone to argue that you know, political pressure is, um, is ineffective in terms of asking an incumbent in power to step down need only look at the case of the, the fall of the Maliki administration now. Um, how this has then permeated uh, you know, um, across the spectrum of, of the Iraqi um, public services, including its military, is quite clear. Um, Iraqi generals are saying it. When the 9th Brigade collapsed last year in June, when June or July, when Islamic State made its big um, uh, expansion, um, the brigade collapsed because of the inability of its logistics contractors to deliver water and food uh, 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 as needed by the Iraqi army as it, prog as it progressed towards its target. If you talk, into, talk to some uh, individuals who knew something about these companies, m many of these companies were effectively just slush companies for 
you know, political slush funds to favor cronies of the regime to take kickbacks off supplying the military, and what happened? Um, broadly speaking, I, I mean, I'll come on to that slide in a second, but, you know, the case studies, I mean, we have that as a case study. The effects of corruption, look at the populist rejections of corruption. Um, Tunisia, the birthplace of the Arab Spring, um, you know, Ukraine. Um, corruption creates cauld cauldrons of instability um, and backlash towards toxic regimes. Um, but also, corruption bleeds a state dry like a vampire to the extent where it then becomes permeable, permeated by, by terrorist networks, even when those states have, aren't necessarily on the front line of, 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 uh, of the so-called war on terrorism or whatever you want to call it. Examples being South Sudan and the D Democratic Republic of Congo, who, whose um, public administrations were bled dry, um, and Al-Shabaab networks are currently operating in both countries. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, there's a powerful lobby uh, in the policy world that says corruption isn't the problem we think it is, and it's a, it's a price worth paying. It's a tax on, on development. Um, well, to, I would say, I would remind Bill Gates perhaps the, the case of um, the Somali contractors that, that were div diverting aid. This is a case from 2009 where powerful businessmen who had made their fortunes during the famines of, of in Somalia after the fall of the regime in 91 and had used those fortunes as aid contractors to then capture state resources including you know the ports, the airports, um, airstrips, uh, 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 livestock markets. Um, one of them then unleashed al-Shabaab as a, as a mercenary force against the government really after a dispute over the control of the port. So al-Shabaab has its generation partly as a, as a fighting force um, for a businessman. Um, just to round up, I mean, very quickly, the consequences of not considering um, or ignoring corruption um, you know, are grave, and, and they actually infect our own or the West's own policymaking uh, uh, a process. And just to round up, I mean, I'll just skip through these slides very quickly. In 2013, the, the Security Council uh, lifted the arms embargo on Somalia. Why? Because in its infinite wisdom, the Security Council deemed that Somalia was ready to fight Shabab. It was a, uh, 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 a recognized international government now, and it, and it needed the resources to do so, notwithstanding the complete lack of accountability within the Somali army itself. One year later, Somali, what do we find? Somali army weapons sold on the open market. This was, uh, this was proved serial number by serial number um, on the rifles that were found. And lo and behold, a presidential advisor um, who is leaking these weapons is also linked to al-Shabaab. Uh, that same presidential advisor is also the man in charge or one of the key person in charge of recovering overseas financial assets that have been rendered inaccessible since the state collapsed in 91, but which the international community is now conferring on the Somali state. So the complete capture of guns and money. Uh, and just the last two slides, this is very important. Amongst those diverted assets, overseas assets that were brought back to Somalia, the Somalis, uh, the, the, a law firm that was contracted by that individual who did not have the authority to use those funds, which should have been conferred to the central bank, engages a lobby firm with those funds to, 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 to lobby U.S. congressmen in Washington to keep the tap of money and guns flowing to a government which has basically short-circuited itself. And the last slide is, um, you know, one wonders also whether the Foreign Office here is caught between uh, an oil deal that was signed in complete um, opacity uh, uh, um, and pressure from the Somali government on the Foreign Office to say, well, if you want this oil deal to survive, um, you know, you'll turn a blind eye to all the corruption scandals that have happened. And, you know, the, the, it's sort of the, the serpent is now eating its tail. Um, so, so, voila, that is how... Um, the mechanics of corruption work, and, and just to conclude and round up, I mean, I think 
you know, there, there are interesting questions about how this can be tackled. Um, revenue streams, monitoring of natural resources, uh, monitoring of national and, and military financial assistance, um, infrastructural loans that then get uh, turned into slush funds. Um, how we tackle these issues are, are the issues of today. And, you know, when we think about even even China's allergic reactions to some of these findings in the past, they are now, the Chinese government are now waking up to this. We can talk about this on the sidelines a bit. Latin American countries at the Security Council, when all the permanent five members have run scared from, you know, the scandal that implicates everyone, Latin American countries have stepped forward and, and actually uh, supported uh, these findings. So they carry some moral authority to now perhaps um, uh, push the, 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 the issue of corruption into the mainstream. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dino. I believe you made really a very good point in the relation between uh, failed states, corruption, and terrorism. I believe you opened our eyes, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, now, um, our last uh, speaker uh, is uh, Professor Christopher Hughes. Professor is the head of uh, International Relations Department of LSE. He's one of our good partners in this strategic alliance. He has a great experience in the Asia, and he's going to present the case of the conflict in South uh, uh, China, Asia, um, China Sea. Mm. Uh, professor. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Um, I mean, first, I suppose I should thank my department for allowing me to speak um, <coughs> and uh, giving me the honor of the last uh, last presentation of the day and I, 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 I thought it, the conference was quite upbeat until we got to this panel and we're a bit like the ghost at the banquet you know um, when you look at security issues it gets a bit depressing but if you think those were depressing wait till you hear about the South China Sea <laughs> anyway <laughs> um, where um, I mean you know this is an area where it's very interesting first of all because so many of the states are the global south um, but also people that are talking about a really 19th century type of geopolitics. It was only last year that the Prime Minister of Japan said that the country, the region is like 1914, you know, it's on the brink of war. The uh, President of the Philippines described China as uh, like Nazi Germany. Um, and, and that is the kind of feeling in the, in the region that it really is on the brink of war. Uh, we see all the traditional signs of good old-fashioned geopolitics here. We see an arms race. We see realignments, power balancing. Um, and as I say, it's interesting because this, much of this is amongst, most of it is amongst uh, or between uh, members of the Global South, um, the Philippines, Vietnam, obviously China. Um, I don't. I, I think we're including Taiwan in the global south now, although I wasn't quite sure from the last panel, or Japan, um, the, and, and India being drawn in as well. So we see this very interesting kind of 19th century, early 20th century geopolitics being played out in the region. Um, and uh, we have to ask why this has happened, especially when we look back just a few years where the expectations were so high. It looked like the re there was a lot of regional integration going on, institution building. It was a kind of textbook case of um, how to do it differently from the good old European way of conflict and power balancing. You had a kind of China model, model emerging. You had the ASEAN plus China free trade area established and, all, and South Korea and, and Japan joining in. Talk of an Asian community and so, so from that situation, we've gone back in time to this really quite dangerous instability um, and talk of warfare. Um, so what has changed? Uh, what caused this? <coughs> um, <coughs> there's the immediate cause was the, the United Nations, I think, and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, 
which asked the various states in the region to lay claims, territorial claims, to their maritime territories. And that triggered off, that was the immediate trigger around about 2008, uh, 2009, that triggered off a lot of this, th these problems. But I would say that we can't blame it all on the UN um, that, uh, and, and UNCLOS, that those kinds of issues would have been manageable before. But something else had changed with 2008. And of course, it was the global financial crisis. And I think none of us really today have really taken this into account, the, the shift of power that took place in 2008 and the confusion that it caused all over the world, but especially in this region because of China and the uncertainty over just how strong China had become in 2008. And I visited China in 2008 and the atmosphere was really very heated uh, for many reasons. It was the year of the Beijing Olympics, so China had arrived on the world stage. Um, then came um, the uh, financial crisis in, t in September. There are a number of other domestic crises over corruption, food safety, and so on. So there's a very strange atmosphere in China. But I think China came out of this with a feeling of hubris, uh, but also a sense of insecurity over the domestic situation. But the hubris was what's important. The sense that the US was in the decline, that um, China had all this power, uh, suddenly economic power which could be converted into hard power and soft power and that the population was expecting the leadership to, to use this power to get back uh, some of the territories that, that uh, the Communist Party and the Chinese government and people claim have been lost. So um, there's this combination of, of, of a kind of um, uh, uh, nationalist feeling and power uh, shift which, um, in which, which set the context for what's going on now. But what's very interesting if we look inside China at the debates, because we had the paper from Professor Pang earlier who I have much respect for and, and knows far more about those debates than me, and if he's still here he might want to correct me later. But looking at those debates, what struck me was uh, after 2008 and the financial crisis, there was a great interest in, uh, by Chinese policymakers and academics in 19th century geopolitics, early 20th century geopolitics. The big figure was, uh, was, was Mahan, the, the, the theorist of American sea power. Um, and, and this became a kind of craze. Bismarck was very popular too, uh, but Mahan was the, the, the most influential because of his theory of sea power. Now, obviously, this is fairly obvious, uh, clear why this should be the case for China. Um, looking at its uh, economy, the amount it imports, its, the volume of its trade, um, you know, this all depends on sea lanes. And so, of course, the argument that you, could, you would need to control the South China Sea, control the Indian Ocean, that you have to redefine your security perimeter uh, to actually include the whole globe and possibly even outer space, um, makes a lot of sense if you adopt a geopolitical logic then it makes sense. Um, but that's not the only logic. And what's interesting is that this became dominant in China. Because if you look back to the earlier period, which Professor Pang talked about earlier, where um, China had this uh, very moderate, uh, cautious foreign policy, if you look back to 2003, um, shortly after China joined the WTO and its economy really took off and it began importing much more, um, Hu Jintao, then General Secretary of the Communist Party, gave a speech on the Malacca Dilemma. The Malacca Straits, of course, is this tiny, you know, this is one of the, the problems of geopolitics, that China's economy depends on keeping the Malacca Straits open. They're only a mile across uh, in places. Now, um, uh, when Hu Jintao raised this issue, uh, there was a big debate in China, and there were people on the military side, the, the think tank side, the strategic analysts, who said, well, we need to build aircraft carriers, we need to secure this militarily, perhaps dig a canal through Thailand or something. Um, <clears throat> but they were looking at it geopolitically. What was interesting at that time was that there were a lot of people in China who were looking at it economically. And who were saying, that's just a waste of money, don't go down that road, we don't need to do that. What we need to do is understand how the Singapore spot market works. We can buy oil, you know, we can do it that way. We use our economic power and, and we work with the international systems. 
What's worrying is that since 2008, that voice has almost disappeared, and instead you see the geopolitical voice very loud indeed, whether it's in government policy, in Communist Party propaganda, or the mass media. You see this kind of um, geopolitical logic dominating. Um, so, um, this is worrying when we look at the region because what it's leading to is this kind of downward spiral of competitive nationalisms. Uh, this summer I went to Vietnam and, and Japan. I had intended to go to the Philippines, which is another, has these problems with China. Um, and you can see that there too you see this, this nationalism on the rise and largely it's a response to that, what's going on in China. And you're getting this cycle where China becomes assertive, pushes out, you get a, uh, nationalism is then triggered off in, in Vietnam or the Philippines or Japan, then their governments uh, and ruling parties are expected to take harder measures to push back. And you get this really quite dangerous um, uh, security dilemma uh, uh, developing. And uh, we saw that this year, last year um, with the anti-Chinese riots in Vietnam where I think it was 18 people were killed who they thought were Chinese. Most of them were not actually Chinese, but they looked Chinese enough to, to kill them um, and destroy a lot of property, Chinese factories and so on. So there's this public opinion is a problem. And last year, Pew uh, actually uh, did their first uh, global survey of perceptions of the United States and China popular perceptions. And what's interesting about this region is that every country, there's a majority of people who expect there to be a conflict with China, a military conflict over these maritime disputes. If you look at countries like Vietnam or Japan, it's up over 80% over of people expect this. Uh, but even in countries like Thailand, which aren't involved directly, it's over 50%. So that's the kind of public opinion that political actors are operating in. Um, now, I, don't, I think, you know, looking back at some of the other panels, when we're talking about the BRICS Bank or something and, and China's sort of role in that, I think we have to understand it in this context. The, China, the Communist Party is not operating in a vacuum. It's operating within that context of this rising nationalism and this geopolitical thinking. So, um, you know, uh, uh, let's not be too naive about that. Um, but when we look at the uh, responses from what's going on in the region, um, we see, uh, again, a very, it is very much like 1914, I guess, uh, or the 1930s. You see these realignments. Uh, and the role of the US has changed from before 2008. People were saying, we'll have an Asian community, and we won't bother to invite the US to the table. Now it's please come back, you know, we need the US. Even the Philippines is, is, uh, is really begging the US to come back and support them. Vietnam is uh, begging the US to come back. Japan, extremely important. I think this is gonna be the most important issue in the region is what's gonna happen in Japan this year with the domestic political changes, the constitutional reforms, um, the move towards legalizing collective security. Um, all kinds of things going on in Japan that have only been made possible by this broader geopolitical context. And then India, which also is being drawn into this, and there are expectations, uh, and, and the Indian Navy has been operating in the South China Sea, has been working with the Vietnamese on uh, uh, Indian oil firms have been in, well, operating with the Vietnamese oil firms in the contested territories. So in the Indian Navy too, I think, has a certain geopolitical outlook which matches that of China. So we get this geopolitical logic dominating. And then finally, of course, we see the Asian pivot of the United States, um, which most people I speak to from Washington expect to not just continue, but to become stronger um, after Obama, that the mood in Washington, the attitude towards China has changed dramatically, be largely because of these issues. Um, Obama started off with a relatively, I think we heard this this morning, you know, uh, a very sort of um, benign view of rising powers, including China, but now I think maybe you can correct me, but after several years of experiencing the, 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 these uh, challenges and this expansion, the, uh, the atmosphere in Washington has changed. Um, so it doesn't look good, uh, and we have to ask what the solutions could be. Um, 
law? Is international law much use? Well, it seems to have caused a lot of the problems here. Um, but the Philippines is going to the, the international court, has taken its case there. China is not interested in this. They don't see these as contested issues. Japan, too, on the East China Sea, is, we're not quite sure, but it doesn't seem too keen on going to court on these issues. So I think law is very limited. Will Xi Jinping help? Will his consolidation of power help? Because one of the theories is that a lot of this activity by China has been driven by internal instability. Well, I think um, we have to watch that. Xi Jinping himself has staked very much on this nationalist kind of uh, geopolitical doctrine. Three minutes, yeah. Um, uh, will, the, will the drop in the oil price help? Now, that, that's a really interesting question, and I hope we, we uh, wish we could all discuss that much more, the implications of the falling oil price. Um, it might make it a bit better because it might be easier for China to buy oil. And, and, uh, but uh, the, the complexities of this for Chinese policymaking, uh, as we, we've been discussing Venezuela's relationship with China and so on, but equally we could look at Russia um, and, uh, and many of the Middle Eastern countries, Syria as well. Uh, Iran. Um, this is going to be a challenge for China, so I don't think we can have any simple answer. This is one to watch. Um, but I say, if I would like to finish with some kind of optimism here, and I do think there is some more cautious thinking emerging in China. I think that after several years of this assertiveness, and in particular the anti-Chinese riots and anti-Chinese movements that have been developing in the region, um, that I detect in a lot of the writing coming from China by academics and trade journals, that uh, people in China are saying, you know, we're going too far, too fast here, and we're going to pay a big price for this. So I think there is room for some uh, movement there. But let's be honest, and, you know, what can we learn from this? Let's not expect too much from regional integration, because it hasn't worked in this case, I'm afraid. Um, maybe we can think about confidence building measures, um, um, but I, I, you know, those have been tried and haven't really worked. Economic interdependence, when does it become actually a source of instability? Because we assume that interdependence is going to create, uh, you know, uh, uh, too, too many losses for both sides if there's a conflict. But actually, what we see with China is that it uses, it's becoming dependency. And I think we had this discussion last year at this conference, uh, interdependence becomes dependency. So we've seen this China's use of economic power for political, geopolitical purposes, the cutting off of banana imports from the Philippines, the cutting off of t tourism to these countries from China. All of this hurts big sectors of those developing countries' economies. Um, so there's an issue, a problem here of dependency. So I think the pro this maybe goes back to one of the issues raised by Dr. S uh, Sagramosa, actually. It's this cultural problem, identity problem, insecurity. We need to really think hard about this and how to address it through education, through the media, careful what we say, what we do, but not too careful because there has to be a degree of balancing and realism in this too. But I think that there's an issue here of post-colonial identity and politics and... Um, uh, which is, is very uh, hard to deal with. And uh, the sad thing is that economic development doesn't seem to have reduced this, but it's actually in some ways made it, made it more difficult to deal with. So I guess I should finish on that to leave some time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, because it's very important to understand uh, this case and, and your concepts always are very, very, very clear for us. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Now we have problems because we don't have <laughs> so many time. But, uh, well, I offer the, the floor. Please be concrete because really we have just for two or three questions. It depends on you. Here. Yes. Good evening, I'm Jason Bushell from International Justice Mission. Um, I haven't heard anything uh, about the, um, the weakness worldwide of, of public justice systems. Uh, I just wondered uh, if we consider development so important. 
Uh, and, and the United Nations in 2008 report estimated that over half the world's population were not actually protected by the law in their own countries. Shouldn't, here comes the question, shouldn't public justice, stre the strengthening of public justice systems be given more priority in terms of uh, in, in that international development aid when, uh, as I understand it, only 1% is given to uh, that, that kind of, uh, through, through that kind of aid at the moment. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I'd like to compliment all the four panelists uh, for very comprehensive presentations. Uh, if uh, the Chair permits, I have two short questions, one to Professor and one to um, Mr. Matani. Uh, on South China Sea, the whole question boils down to the so-called nine dash lines, which are on Chinese maps. Now, uh, they have not been clear on what they mean, actually. They have been actually keeping a strategic ambiguity so that when it comes, they can use whatever position. Now, there are three interpretations to the uh, nine dash line. One, it could mean that all the islands within the dash line belong to China. The second interpretation could be all the waters, they have uh, historical rights going back to 200 years or more. And the third interpretation can be the Nine Dash Line is the maritime boundary of China. Now, all these have separate implications for UNCLOS. Uh, by the way, China is actually a signatory and they have ratified the UN uh, Convention on Law of the Sea. So I would like to have your views on if China is pushed, that is a big if, to take a decision, which of the three interpretations would they like to defend? And uh, on um, terrorism, the uh, explanation of uh, Al-Shabaab, I found it very interesting. Just a very short question. Do you think that the same uh, arguments also apply to Boko Haram and Nigeria? Because you made a very interesting uh, turn of phrase that uh, many uh, countries or many regimes use disorder as a political tool. So because of that, do you think Boko Haram has the same kind of problems like Al-Shabaab? Okay. Um, be there. Go, oh, go. Oh. Gracias. Yo quería simplemente Thanks very much. I just wanted to ask to my dear friend, Jose Miguel Insulza. He boosted a project on a very sensitive issue, which is drugs. And because of this, we should all be very positive, all of us working on that project. My question is the following. Considering the experience showed by that study and many other actions in which the international community has been working on in the war against drugs, if, if we haven't reached the conclusion that this is a value issue and a question of cultures within each community linked to the matrix of each community rather than to the international aspect of the question, then I think that if this is an issue linked to the community itself, it's not an issue related to powers, but rather to the public opinion, which is what I think, actually. I um, don't know what you think about this. The first question. No, the first question. On, yeah, I mean, I I'll just what I wanted to mention about the first question is that um, I fully agree that there is always a need to ensure the protection of rights of the citizens. Uh, the, the big challenge in the areas of the former Soviet space and Eastern Europe is the uh, how do we uh, sort of uh, combine the individual rights with the uh, community rights or minority rights, you know, and to what extent, you know, uh, 
upholding a particular language, uh, you know, is, is seen as a particular right of a community versus a right of the whole of the country, which is upholding a different language. So I think there it's, it's, it's much more difficult and much more complex. Uh, and the same, I think, applies to Europe when we talk about Islam and, you know, certain ways of behavior. Uh, I think the challenges are, are, are a lot more complex there, and I think the debate is open. I don't really have a, an answer to that question. But I think it's very important to make sure that both elements are present, uh, but that there isn't too much of an emphasis on a particular community. And that, uh, as I said at a seminar, you know, it's with a Hungarian colleague, you know, was talking a lot about the minorities in Hungary, who, you know, Hungarian minorities in East European countries which aren't really having their rights protected. And I said, more important is to have someone that actually protects you as a citizen, as an individual, uh, as a policeman, rather than as, as yourself for being part of a minority. So I think there, there are a lot of challenges that are very important to address. Thank you, Amitila. Secretary. To answer on the matter of international justice, I mean, and, uh, well, I agree that the, the system, that system has to be strengthened. The problem is that we have, uh, we have two kinds of problems here. For one, I will, um, uh, referred to with Latin America, but it does are also some other, some other cases, is the fact that it's difficult to have a, 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 fully, a full justice system if some countries abstain from it. And we have a system of human rights, for example. It's a good system in terms of a commission on human rights, which is basically charged with uh, uh, trying to reach agreements among countries, trying to reach solutions, etc., and has a choice to take that to a court of human rights if, they, if there is no response for that. Some countries, and I should say, some countries fully respect the decisions of the Commission on Human Rights. They don't even have to be taken to court for that unless they disagree with something the Commission has done. Others uh, are more difficult on several matters. I mean, the, the Commission is every time sending more matters to court. The problem is that only the Latin Americans belong to the court. The countries of South America, have, the, of North America, have not, I mean, the U.S. signed the convention, but has not ratified it, and Canada has not even signed it. And now, I, I should say this, I mean, when there were very, many, many violations in Latin America in the, in the 70s and the 80s, nobody really cared that much about that, frankly. I mean, they just, I mean, everybody used the, 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 the system, and the system was very active, because we had real big problems. Now, we have democracies everywhere, we still have violations of human rights, but countries feel that they are more enti ent entitled to a bit more of a, a, a equality in this. So therefore, some countries are not paying attention to the Convention on Human Rights, or to the Commission on Human Rights, and others are withdrawing from the Commission. And I think that if we have that situation, if we have systems of international justice with so many exceptions, the other one, the other case is the, the International Criminal Court. I mean, they actually, there is a board of appeals for, be, for not being taken to the criminal court, which is the, the Security Council. Therefore, it's very clear that five countries at least are never going to be taken to the court. And that, I would say, relative, makes it, relativizes very much the strength of the courts. Now, the other issue is other systems of justice which are not dealing with matters of human rights and all that. And we have a, uh, also a, uh, a, a, um, a convention, which is one of the oldest in the OAS, as OAS. It was signed together with our charter, which is the, the Pacto de Bogotá, the Bogotá Pact for Peaceful Solution of, of, of Conflict, which provides for all kinds of, uh, of avenues for peaceful solutions, and finally, it's interesting, in a charter of the OAS, in a document of the OAS, provides for a recourse to the, to the International Court of Justice. Now, again, that is not signed and ratified by every country. And, well, we have two, recently we have two kinds of problems. So one, some countries are, are joining, the, the now, are now withdrawing their objections because they want to take a, a case to the court, and the others are withdrawing when the commission when the decision of the court doesn't re respond to what they, what they want. Unfortunately, the country that bears the name of the convention, the Pacto de Bogotá, just withdrew because they didn't like the decision of the, of the court. So I think that it's very much to the country. In the international system is form of sovereign states. And uh, what, what, what the, the founder of the, I mean, the, the first secretary general of the OAS 
said about the OAS applies to all these kinds of conventions and all kinds. I mean, the, it, the, he said the OAS will be exactly what these member countries wanted to be. And in multilateralism, that's the, that's the bottom line, and unfortunately, it's limiting uh, several matters in matters of international justice. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say with, about what the, the, the dear said, uh, yes, I think that many of things, these things have to do with values, that's true. And actually, uh, that is, has been, I mean, always trends, in, with cultural trends inside societies. But then uh, the process in general also affects countries that initially don't have a trend, a trend a, a, don't have those trends. I mean, for a long time, in, for example, in matter of drug, we thought that we could divide very clearly between cultivation, countries in which drugs are cultivated because we are the ones that, I mean, you can only crop uh, uh, cocaine in, 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 in Peru and Bolivia, and I would say in Colombia they have been successful doing it too, but there are no, no, only those countries. Then that you had countries of uh, transit and you had countries of consumption. But the increase of drug consumption in the transit countries, for example, has been important. I mean, for some reason they didn't use, them, use it before, but the, the, the process of the, of the drug, of the, I mean, that's created uh, problems that we didn't, we didn't perceive. Of course, there's a lot of corruption having to do with this. There's payment in drugs. Many of the, many of the smugglers are paid with drugs or that. So it becomes more than a value problem, basically a criminal problem in general. Huh? But I agree that in, 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 these, in, in value matters, let me say, I said that I was in, in fa I'm very much in favor of a lot of things in legalization. But I really think that we should go step by step and not force matters on societies. If you have in value matters, if you have societies that are very divided and you impose a certain solution by a very few votes, that will eventually have a repercussion, higher repercussion, that if you wait for some, for some time, experiment a little bit more, go slower, and finally we'll probably get more consensus on dealing with this and those, religion, those uh, decisions will stick better than others. Thank you. Professor, shall I answer? Well, I, I, <laughs> I, I deliberately didn't, didn't talk about the technicalities. The legal technicalities, because it's so complicated. Um, the nine-dash line is relatively simple, I guess, because it's just a big line that includes the whole of the South China Sea, which originally was put there in 1947, before the communists came to power, even. <laughs> Um, what does it mean? Um, we don't know because the Chinese will not say and part of the Philippines um, case in the international court is to ask exactly what the nine dash line means and the US too has been asking for clarification. Now China will not give that so we have to ask why not? Um, because it's actually, uh, um, there are many reasons. Um, I guess um, the uh, it's quite good strategically to be ambiguous over this. That China can use this in many ways. One of them is to keep other countries guessing. Um, so when the Chinese declared a moratorium on what they claimed was parts of their territorial sea uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a fishing moratorium, no one knew where that actually extended to. But it created a lot of tension and fear amongst fishermen in the region because they weren't sure when they were going to get arrested by the Chinese Coast Guard. Um, so it created that kind of tension. And the question we have to ask is, why does China want to create a sense of tension and fear and panic? Uh, and part of that reason, I would suggest, is to do with domestic politics, where um, if we think that the Nine Dash Line goes back to 1947, there's been lots of time to kind of take this out of the discourse and try and quietly get, uh, uh, forget about it and resort more to, to more legal, uh, real legal um, claims. But instead, it's actually been used more. Uh, it even appeared in a new version of the Chinese passport a couple of years ago on a page in the Chinese passport. It's used in school textbooks. It's used on the official map at all events. It has to be legally. So it's used a lot. Now, that's not a legal use. That's a political use. And that's how you have to understand the Nine Dash Line. So children are taught in schools that this is Chinese territory. They're not taught about international law. They're taught this is Chinese territory that we have lost and have to get back. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, in the interest of time, just some very quick responses. Public strengthening of justice system, of course, uh, you know, the rule of law is fundamental. Corruption is the sim is a symptom of impunity. And clearly, people need to go to jail. Um, 
the questions are, one, who's going to do this? Who's going to build that capacity? Uh, certainly not governments who have an interest in extracting uh, uh, rents from, you know, on behalf of its own political economic constituents and narrow interests. Uh, two, even if you do reach a threshold of, of uh, pouring resources into, into you know, domestic uh, uh, capacity building of justice, it's not just purely a technical matter. You know, how many chairs and laptops and, and you know, policemen can you uh, uh, bring to a system um, if, if the core of its political system is toxic from the inside? Um, on Boko Haram, um, uh, on Boko Haram, um, yes, I mean, the, the origin of Boko Haram is political. Both uh, uh, regime, uh, both ruling party and opposition party had links to Boko Haram in the in the early days pr prior to 2009, many of these guys were armed robbers, highwaymen, who were rounded up by political godfathers and turned into a monster. Um, and now look where they are. And, and I think the same goes for, you know, the same, the same political connections also apply to Islamic State. I mean, it's fairly openly known where they get their external financing from. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you <clears throat> to all the speakers and thank you to you uh, for being here with us uh, in this uh, session. Uh, I really believe that we need really a global, clear leadership to take the measures that the world needs to confront these challenges. Next year's will be a, really a, a matter of decision and a matter of leadership for our political leaders. Thank you very much.